Next, uh, thank you for your patience, Senator Carper. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief Conti, as a former governor of the first state of Delaware, for eight years I recall numerous instances in, in which I uh, call on the Delaware National Guard uh, in emergencies. They could have been the floods, blizzards, ice storms, drought, you name it, a lot more. Uh, I know the importance of uh, the valiant work that our citizen soldiers have done for decades in the first state and other states around the country. As we have learned in contrast to literally every other state's National Guard in the country, the D.C. National Guard operates differently. And I, I'm, I'm convinced if, if someone had been able to activate the, the, the uh, D.C. National Guard and have a thousand or two thousand uh, guardsmen and women uh, deployed at the Capitol uh, in a timely way on the, the, the 6th of January, this destruction, this death and destruction would not have occurred. The, uh, the leader of uh, the, uh, unlike the, all the states of the 50 states that we have, the leader of the District of Columbia is not empowered to activate the uh, DC National Guard during an emergency. That's one of the reasons why I've worked for years with Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton to, in support of legislation to admit uh, Washington, D.C. as our 51st state and to provide equal rights to the Americans who make this community of over, gosh, over 700,000 people their home. It's a question, Chief Cotty, in your testimony, you highlight that a request for D.C. National Guard assistance at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th would have been uh, to, uh, would have had to have uh, been made by the U.S. Capitol Police with the consent of the U.S. Department of Defense. Can you just take a minute to explain that process and why Mayor Bowser is not able to request D.C. National Guard assistance when federal installations and property as well as human lives uh, are threatened in the district that she leads? Please go ahead. Yes, thank you uh, for the question. Yeah, so the mayor does not have uh, full authority uh, over the National Guard uh, to include their uh, activation uh, or, de or deployment. Uh, when the mayor, uh, we make a request uh, as the uh, District of Columbia, uh, we make a request, we send that uh, to the federal government. Uh, ultimately, the uh, secretary of uh, the Secretary of the Army uh, receives that request. There's a whole approval process that that request has to go through in order for National Guard resources to be deployed to the District uh, of Columbia. Uh, unlike governors and other states who are able to activate their National Guard uh, without going through uh, those approval processes and receiving uh, 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 approval from the highest level of the federal government, uh, we just uh, that that just does not have to take place in, in other states. So a real hindrance to us in terms of uh, response and the ability to call them up. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that response. Could you just take a minute to share with us your thoughts on whether having a uh, D.C. National Guard under the command of a mayor or even a governor of a neighboring state might help the, the D.C. Metropolitan Police in coordinating with federal authorities to better protect the city and its citizens and uh, along with uh, federal installations during assault like the one we experienced on January the 6th? Yes, I think we I think we certainly uh, should. Um, we found we we know even on that day on January the sixth, uh, you know, prior to any movement of the National Guard from the assignments that they had been given, the traffic posts, uh, again, that required approval at the highest levels of the federal government to include the Secretary uh, of the Army and the Secretary of Defense in order to to just move the National Guard or change of mission in uh, in essence. So uh, yes, I think that that should certainly be something that falls under the mayor's authority. All right, thanks so much. A question, if I could, for Mr. Sun. Mr. Sun, in your testimony, you state that the events of January 6th were not the result of poor planning on behalf of the U.S. Capitol Police, uh, but rather a, a lack of actionable intelligence that uh, would have allowed the... Uh, that would have allowed the... Uh, uh, let me start over. But rather a lack of actionable intelligence that would have allowed the U.S. Capitol Police, the Capitol Police to properly prepare. As I was looking through Mr. Stinger's testimony, and former Sergeant at Arms for the U.S. Senate, he, he states, and I want to quote, he says, the sharing of information and resources is paramount for success. That's it. That's his quote. I strongly agree with that statement. Uh, Mr. Sun, uh, what went wrong leading up to January 6th with regard to gathering and sharing actual intelligence? Why do you think uh, the likelihood of a truly devastating attack was so badly underestimated, Mr. Sun? 
I think as you uh, start to hear some, some, from some of the federal agencies on the investigations that are currently going on, where they're finding the evidence that this was a coordinated attack uh, that had been coordinated among uh, numerous states for some time in advance of this, that's the information that would have been extremely helpful to us. For them to detect some type of level of coordination that would have given us the in indication that we're going to see more than just a may become violent, that, you know, may be inclined uh, to violence. Uh, type of type of preparations. You look at it now. You see, you know, knowing what occurred, you see what type of resources were brought to bear around the uh, around the Capitol. That type of information could have give us, uh, ex you know, sufficient advance warning to pre plan for more of an, an attack such as what we saw. The great uh, Paul Newman movie, uh, Cool Hand Luke, a line, line you probably a lot of people, certainly in my generation, remember. What we have here is a failure to communicate. I was right at the end of the film. What, what we have here is a failure to communicate. Uh, do we have a failure to communicate here? Where, where, and uh, I'm not one who's crazy about like pointing fingers and assigning blame, but to whom do we assign that uh, failure to communicate? I believe that question's for me, sir. What I, what I look at is, you know, we have a process for communications, and it being a consumer of intelligence, I look at it more of, you know, we're, I think there's a, a failure of having a wide enough lens to look at what are the current threats that we're facing uh, in, in, in a nation uh, now from some of the domestic extremists. Uh, I think the communications processes are there. They need to be worked on a little bit, but I think the intelligence community needs to uh, broaden its aperture on what information it collects. We now know, in, in retrospect, that the the, uh, the gathering on uh, uh, the uh, the rioters on January 6th didn't begin on January 5th or the 4th or the 3rd. It started like weeks before, and uh, was fomented and encouraged, as as we now know, by by among others, our our, our president. And somehow, that uh, all of that work and all the intelligence that was gathered by the FBI and other Homeland Security never got it, found its way to the people who, right here in D.C., could have used it the most to have uh, avoided the tragedy of January the 6th. Thank you. Our, our thanks to uh, particularly the, the officers of the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol Police and, and others who joined them in trying to protect us and, and this Capitol on that uh, sad day.